We're going to talk about a really important topic today, and that is, you know, we hear so much about clinical trials, and we need more diversity in clinical trials, but you have three amazing experts and a great moderator that are going to really bring it home and get real about it and talk about ways that we can make getting diversity real, making improvements, and so without further ado, Dina, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Aaron. It's so great to be here. Is my mic on? Are we good? Okay, great. Uh, well, it's fantastic to meet you in person and, and know that you're real, uh, Aaron. It's been all virtual for a couple of years now, so this is amazing. Um, and thank you so much for kicking off the conversation with those important notes. And I have to say, I feel so at home among a bunch of fellow healthcare nerds and talking about health equity um, amidst um, all that's going on today. So welcome, and I'm thrilled to kick it off. We only have 30 minutes. And it would probably take me that long to just go through each individual bio. So we're not going to do that. I assume most of you know the, uh, the, the bios or have read of our esteemed panelists. And so I'll just briefly say their names and where they're from. We're going to kick off the conversation with a quick 90 seconds from each of you introduction, who you are, what you do, and why you're here. So we've got Cherie Butts from Biogen over on the other side of the stage, Brian Hansen over here from Janssen, and Kelly McKee from Metadata. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Brian, to start with a 90 Perfect. second. Who are you? Why are you here? Yeah. And what does clinical trial Great. inclusion and diversity mean to you? Well, thank you so much. Uh, thanks to uh, Real Chem for, for hosting this. Really excited to be here. So my name is Brian Hansen, and uh, by way of training and background, I have a degree in neuroscience and have always been fascinated by information processing in the brain. Um, until recently, I started to really explore how we could look at digital enablement of clinical trials using a variety of different technologies and devices to identify patients to, to really understand the day-to-day. -day. So if we are really to try to be active in the patient journey and understand the patient, we want to like understand their you know, activity using wearable devices, using really sophisticated data analytics techniques. And I think it's really important that we focus on not only the patient experience and harmonization of data at the you know, uh, user interface, but then also at the back end in terms of data analytics. You know, we are developing algorithms to identify Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease earlier, and we need a diverse population in order to do that. Thank you. Kelly. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Kelly McKee. I'm a vice president in Patient Cloud, which is our patient uh, facing technology uh, solutions at Metadata. I spent the first 20 years of my career on the sponsor side, working at places like Sanofi, Merck, Lilly, uh, most recently Vertex. And then about two years ago, I took the leap over te te to technology, and I've been having a blast um, really focusing on improving patient experiences in clinical research through technology solutions. I was also, or I am still, a participant in the Pfizer COVID uh, clinical trial as well. And that has just been so eye-opening, uh, looking at it from the patient perspective. Um, it was hard to get in. It, there were times when I wanted to throw my phone against the wall because mm -hmm. the technology was so terrible. Um, and so just really understanding things from different perspectives has really just made me um, an all-around better person. Hi, my name is Cherie Butts. I am a medical director at Biogen. My career has uh, gone through many different paths. I am trained as a neuroimmunologist. My role now is as a clinical trialist, so leading clinical trial activities. Uh, in, the, in the realm of clinical trials, most organizations are talking about the importance of diversity, and um, I've had the pleasure of all of my studies have been very diverse, and we can talk about that you know, why is that a little bit later, but I want to borrow from what Brian said. It's not just about getting uh, diverse trials where, you know, your trials look like the black eyed peas. It's about the data <laughs> itself. It's about the analysis and something that we've done with, with at least my trials and we're doing it for all others is once we have enough people who are not from the same background, we're doing subgroup analysis to see is there really differences because there's a lot of comments about, oh, you know, if you're, if you're black, then you should add this number, or if you're Latinx, you, should, you should, should subtract. But if you never had a representative trial, where is that coming from? And so with our trials, so in, in one particular case, the interferons, which is, which is now approved, we did a subgroup analysis and showed 
black and white, no difference. And so we need to be doing that far more often. It's, it's not just getting them in, it's actually using that information. Thank you. Well, uh, to set the stage a little, um, it's funny that Aaron mentioned the comment on the lack of sleep. So if anybody follows me on Twitter, you know that I'm very vocal about uh, diversity and inclusion in venture, on cap tables and with founders. And frankly, a lot of the arguments toward that are actually somewhat applicable to what we think about in the context of clinical trials. And specifically, it's that DNI, whatever you want to call it, being more inclusive in our research is not about philanthropy. It's not about charity. It's not that it's even good for the world. It's fundamentally better for science. And within the context of what I do for a living, it's fundamentally about the bottom line. You know that mm -hmm. diverse cap tables, diverse founding teams, women and underrepresented founded companies literally perform better. Faster time to exit, more revenue, more profitability. We know in the context of science, in the context of clinical research, you will not get high quality, high fidelity outcomes. You may end up in life-threatening situations if you don't have that. But it's shocking that until fairly recently that wasn't a mandate, it wasn't even a consideration. And there's still so many cases in which it's an afterthought. So I want to uh, ask each of the panelists in the context of the pandemic, specifically in the last two years, what tide shift, or has there been a tide shift that you have noticed in the context of the, the specific indications and the companies that you're working on? And how can we ensure that that's here to stay and not just lip service? It's a, it's a great question. I, I think really what the pandemic has showed patients and care partners and, and that society is that we can do trials remotely and we can be successful at it. And that means bringing aspects of the clinical uh, brick and mortar site to the patient. That means through you know, connected devices, through the use of technology, through uh, some really innovative you know, passive sensing behavior and, and remote monitoring. You know, patients don't want to have to come into a site. They don't want to get sick. They don't want to have to have to drive. You know, the distance. You know, it's it's very clear that one of the biggest exclusion criteria from a trial is distance to the site. So why would we continue to put that pressure on a caregiver and and the patient to have to drive in for for these tests that we know that we can successfully do at home? Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Kelly. Yeah, so we've seen a dramatic increase in the number of trials that include at least one aspect of decentralization. And the FDA really defines decentralization as any activity that's done not at a brick and mortar site. So if you look at an ePro or eConsent or a video visit or remote monitoring, these are all considered components of decentralization. But what we've also found is that traditionally, the patient-physician relationship was what sponsors really counted on to have patients continue in a trial. When you're starting to take that outside of the traditional brick and mortar site, you really need to pay attention to the technology and the experience of the technology. We all have good and bad experiences with technology, so it's so important that you consider the patient perspective as you're designing your trials, as you're designing the DCT components, because a lost patient is worse than a patient that's not enrolled. So I want to borrow from what you said, because okay. the work that we did over the pandemic really highlighted, you all read about the health inequities. OK, we, we, we knew that. It got spotlighted. We understood that. Clinical trials, yes, they were affected, because if it wasn't about COVID, then the hospitals where the vast majority of trials are being conducted, they weren't letting that happen. But what we noticed was this patient-physician relationship was critical. Mm -hmm. And so for our work, we took a step back. It's not simply about asking someone to participate in a trial. It's also about their healthcare experience. If people are not having a good relationship with their physician, there was a lot of physician shoppings with the non-white participants. And if you're not addressing that healthcare experience, then you can't ask the question about a clinical trial. And so we noticed that we really have to be considering what happens before they get there and making sure that they're in a good space, they can participate fully. And to me, what's most important to, to your point 
is the burden of a trial. Mm -hmm. Like, we have to be realistic about it. Mm -hmm. Trials are not easy, and that's why that's your story resonated so well, yeah. this throwing at the phone, that's a real situation. It's not simply about getting people to agree to it, signing up, enrolling. It's actually about completing. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. if we can't do that, then we failed, not them. Yeah. I love that. That's, I think the way that I often describe um, you know, the context of community care and the importance of, of cultural competency within research is within the context of the vaccines, actually, and the incredible innovation that went into literally the rocket science that enabled us to be here today uh, without masks on, talking to each other. Remarkable. Record timing, amazing science, but at the end of the day, that wasn't enough. You needed to meet patients where they are physically, intellectually, culturally, and that element of trust is not something that you can innovate your way through, right? And I think that's absolutely true in the context of clinical trials where there are so many points of attrition. Getting someone to know about it in the first place is one of the hardest things. Once they know, how do they sign up? Once they sign up, how do they get there? Once they get there, how do they stay? Retention, et cetera. Um, and so one question I wanted to ask is, uh, you know, relative to this concept of remote trials and decentralization, I, I do a lot of investing outside of clinical trials as well. I do a lot in virtual care and telehealth. And one thing that's really important to us at Lux in terms of our thesis is that we're, of course, investing in the 10-year horizon. And so in the context of telemedicine, which has been around since carrier pigeons, nothing new, <laughs> Is the care delivery actually better by the application of technology, or is it simply digitizing an experience? In the context of clinical trials, how confident are you all that decentralization or technology applied to um, the, the, the clinical trial delivery itself is better, even once we emerge from this pandemic? And if not, what are the other lessons we can learn from the last two years? Anybody wants to kick it off? I see some nods. I'll go, I'll go first. Yeah. So this is a very important question, but let me say why. When you go to the clinic, it's a very contrived setting. It's not what I'm used to as a participant. But if you do it at my home, I'm actually more relaxed. It's more mm -hmm. natural. So I do think in that respect, it's better because I do get a better sense of exactly how people are operating. Now, the caveat is everybody's home is different. Mm. So if you have a clinical trial, how do you compare people and participants across a group if everybody's got a different situation? Some people have stairs, some people don't. Um, but I do love the idea of using that home setting or being remote because I'm going to navigate life the way I normally would versus in a hospital, I may run into something because I just didn't know it was there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's the bridge that we have to, to, to gap. But uh, you know, it's we're still going to do it. But I think I still think it's worth it because of the benefits of it. We have to figure out how do we, um, you know, make sure that everything is equal if everybody's got a different uh, home situation. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I would I would just build on that because what's so fundamental is that we ask patients to come to a clinic for a cognitive assessment, mm -hmm. and this is a subjective assessment. It's usually rated by a physician on a on a on a scale from you know, zero to four or, or some aspect. And what we can now do in the home, in that setting that they're familiar with, we can get a sense of active data, them doing the cognitive assessment, but then we can also put it into context. Mm -hmm. How was their previous night's sleep? What was their activity level like? What's their mood? What's their you know, level of engagement in the, in the task? We can start to assess that, to really get a, a deeper understanding of that cognitive performance. Well, that's a great segue into a question I have for you, Kelly. Oh, okay. We are both wearing aura, aura rings. Aura rings. Yep. I don't know if we've got any other aura wearers around here or Apple Watches. I'd love to get a sense um, from you and from yep. others about how you integrate these consumer-oriented types of wearables mm -hmm. that are increasingly doing more on the clinical side into the clinical trials that you're doing and how much confidence you have in the future of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to answer your other question, Go too. for it, please. Um, yeah, so going back to your other question, I would argue that the data that we receive directly from patients is even better. Mm -hmm. So think about uh, patient-reported outcomes. Mm -hmm. Back in the old days, it was you were filling out the paper diary in your car when you were waiting to go into the hospital or into your doctor's office and who remembers you know what you ate three days ago or you know how you slept talking about sensors 
sometimes I wake up and I'm like, I had a terrible night's sleep, but my ring says it was great. Yeah. So like, where's that dichotomy, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so when we combine a patient reported outcome with data from sensors, you're getting a much better understanding of what's really going on from a patient perspective, that qualitative and quantitative. Mm -hmm. And through technology, we're able to look at those um, variables in the data so that you can draw meaningful conclusions. And we need to remember that a clinical trial, it's, it's really an it's a question, right? We're answering questions with data. And so sometimes it's hard to parse out the, all of the data to answer that question. So it's really important that when you're combining technologies that you start out by asking the right questions so that you can get that right answer at the end. Yes, so I wanna borrow from two pieces of what you said. I do believe to your question that the technology that now exists for everyone could be useful. However, everyone wears differently, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so you have to resolve that, that difference in, you know, you could have a watch, but what if I wear it too loosely and it's not detecting consistently? So there's still a little bit of a gap that we have to, yeah. to fill for that as well. But going back to the answering of the previous question, Something that's really important to me with clinical trials is feasibility. Mm -hmm. So feasibility is, you know, can it be done? But most people think about feasibility in terms of this is the assessment, is a, is a participant able to complete it? That is skill. But it's not just skill, it's will and skill. Mm. Because if I'm yes. not having a good day, yep. the answers will look like I can't do it. Mm. And so we still need to bridge that gap, which is why the patient reported plus the yes. assessments, yep. that's going to tell us yep. the truth. Because I could be having a really bad day and my, my, my sensor is saying I'm, I'm okay, but I can tell you that and then whatever my other metrics are that are being calculated, then I'll know what the truth is. Yep. But the other piece of that is it's catching it more often. Yep. When I go into a clinic, it's once every two weeks. You better hope I'm having a good day <laughs> because that's it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But if you can catch it along the way, a continuum, yeah. then I can tell you, yeah, Thursday was a bad day. You know, I didn't get the bonus or the promotion I wanted. Wednesday was a much better day because I found, you know, the love of my you life. You really did. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that's what that's what it's yeah. going to offer us. It's more continuous, more objective information. Exactly. Hundred yeah. percent. I want to ask a question to the audience first, and then we're going to ask the panelists to, um, to defend their opinions on this as well. And it's going to be a quick poll. So um, when I think about healthcare innovation, I think about, I call it the four Ps, some, some stakeholders that we have to engage, right? There's pharma. We've got a lot of pharma around, uh, in the room. There are providers, there are payers, and there are patients. And there are a lot of other folks around the table, but these are some of the big stakeholders that we need to engage. So I want to just do a quick poll in the context of clinical trial recruitment in particular and the challenges that we're talking about here. I'm going to go through each one of them. I'd love to get a show of hands for who thinks that, that each, which category is the primary gatekeeper toward improving diversity in clinical trials. Um, so a quick show of hands, we'll go through each and then I'll ask you to defend your opinion. So, who thinks pharma is the main gatekeeper that's preventing more in, uh, diversity and inclusion in clinical trials? Anyone? Blame big pharma? It's the no? It's no? No? Okay, we can get a sense <laughs> for who's in the room. All right. Payers? Anyone think payers are the primary gatekeeper? We got one. All right. Patients? How many people think patients? Okay. Providers? I mean, all of you, I assume, are going to raise your hands now. Okay, <laughs> providers as the primary gatekeeper. Interesting. Um, now, I'd like each of you to just say one word of which, which it is, and then we'll talk about defending those. So let's start. Okay, okay. I'm not going to call them gatekeepers because I need them. Yeah. <laughs> um, however, I do think that providers make or break the representation of a trial. As I said before, all of my trials have been very representative, but I'm a sponsor. Mm -hmm. I don't actually see the people who are asked to participate in the study, mm -hmm. but I spend an extensive amount of time with the investigators. And we have conversations about what's important to them, uh, you know, what do you need to support your patients and, and all of these others. And so I didn't actually ask them to make sure it was representative, mm -hmm. but maybe hanging out with someone from my demographic, they were like, well, you know, we like her enough that maybe we'll get people who look like her to be
be in the trial. So I, I wouldn't call it gatekeepers, but I will say that they make decisions um, that are very critical to whether or not a trial is representative. Excellent, thank you. Kelly? I have to say all of them. There's a lot that we need to do to improve this space, and we're not going to do it with a one-pronged approach. Mm -hmm. And so only when we make clinical trials more accessible to everybody, only we, when we make it easier to participate for both providers and patients, only when payers say, I'm not going to reimburse unless you enrolled a representative population, okay. and only when pharma says, yep, this is just as important as the science, are we going to make you know meaningful headway? That was very well said. I love it. Thank you, Brian. Uh, you, Nothing you, to add. Have to, have to agree with that. That's, that, that is. That is the office. We'll find it. I love it. I love it. Answer. Yeah, but no, it's really fundamental. They all have to work together. Everyone needs a seat at the table. And I would add maybe a, a C to the four Ps: the care partner. Yeah. So you really need to understand that that role and the and the struggle and the and the burden that that patient, you know, in the, in the family unit has. We'll just say partner so we can yeah. keep it in the piece. Par okay, all right, all right. Partner, <laughs> partner. There we go. Yeah, that's fine. All right, well, the one thing that we know is that not all clinical trials are the same, and certainly certain indications present very different challenges and different opportunities. Whether we're talking oncology, where timing can be very, very critical and there's urgency, or the context of therapeutic development for chronic disease. I'd love to get a sense of where you see the greatest opportunity for innovation and the sort of solutions that are coming to the table that are the most exciting within some of the different indications that we're looking at. Uh, I've seen some, personally, some really interesting things coming out of oncology in particular. Um, and of course, COVID, you know, lots of interesting things came out of those trials as well. So does anybody want to start? I, oh, I, I, I'm wearing a brain pin. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it's, 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 it's neuroscience, it's neurodegeneration, <laughs> it's, you know, fundamentally what is, has been kind of the focus over the last 20 years has been treating the symptoms of a disease. Mm -hmm. But only recently can we actually start saying that we can look at this in terms of a disease modifying approach. Mm -hmm. And what that requires us to do now is to find patients, to find individuals who are clinically silent. Mm -hmm. they, they are cognitively normal, but they have an underlying pathology where we now need, where the current measures are not sensitive enough for, for us to, to identify them. So the use of technology, the ability to collect subtle changes in behavior continuously, objectively, mm -hmm. will allow us to do that. So I think that neuroscience has, has kind of one of the, that's, I love that's it. my My father runner. would be proud. He's a yeah. neuropsychiatrist. So uh, in the context of neuro, I'm curious, are there particular technologies that are enabling us to have more specific, specificity around, uh, or specificity? I just mix yeah. sensitivity, S sensitivity and specificity. specificity yeah. um, around how we measure brain uh, behavior. So, so it's, it's a combination of, of those active and passive data you know, streams that I was referring mm -hmm. to before. So looking at aspects of, of speech, looking at you know, heart rate, you know, you know, variability, mm -hmm. activity, you know, cognition, sleep. There's, there's several different things that we can use in combination that I think is really powerful once you kind of create that whole picture of what a neurodegenerative disease looks like. Absolutely. Because so, it's too multifaceted for, for one, one tool. Excellent. Kelly? I, I'm going to quote our late CEO and, and friend, Glenn DeVries, and it's personalized medicine. Mm -hmm. um, the science is just overwhelmingly cool right now, mm -hmm. but clinical operations is still in the 90s, and so we do need to bridge that gap. So mm -hmm. as we continue to make headway with science, we need to catch up in the way that we're running clinical trials, designing clinical trials, engaging you know, patients and sites in clinical trials. So we've got a lot of work to do, but the science is still really cool. Mm -hmm. awesome. I love that all of us have different answers that are all really good. Mm -hmm. I know, I may say mine, mine are the favorites. But, um, <laughs> so I, I will say that I have, I grew up as an immunologist. I learned endocrinology. I, I'm now in neuro and I learned neurology on the way. And one thing that I find is that we're very siloed, unfortunately. So mm -hmm. I feel like there are things that I bring from immunology. I'm like, you know, we do this. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be useful here? Mm -hmm. And so I would say we call it we call it a neuro disease, but we also call it an immune disease depending on the audience. But MS is a perfect place. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what we use in our trials are immunology 
technologies, mm -hmm. like ELISA's and things like that, you know, things we've been using for years, but you're applying it in the neuro field. Mm -hmm. And I think the cross-fertilization is where it's going to be really advancing and propel science, bio, biomedical research mm -hmm. forward, is, is thinking about how can we apply this in a space where it's not usually applied. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, as a, as a VC, we tend to look at a lot of different areas, and so I get very excited about thinking about the intersection points of those. And speaking of VC, I want to do another quick poll. Are there any founders, startup founders in the room here? All right. <laughs> there we go. And I'm sure there's many. there are many who are watching as well. So I've got a lot in, in my portfolio. My partners have a lot. And I want to ask a question that's somewhat selfish for some of these startup founders that we're, that we're supporting, which is, I am sure you are all looking for innovative technologies to partner with in the context of the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Many of these founders are looking to work with each one of you and many of the folks in this room, and that matching is very difficult. So mm -hmm. how do you think about finding, working with, um, and, uh, and identifying the best technological solutions out there and young startups to work with? Who wants to go first? And if not, we'll give you a list of some that you can I've got it. <laughs> So I will say that for me personally, before I was at Biogen, I was at FDA. And there's a lot of cool science and a lot of cool technology, but it is nowhere near regulatory acceptance. Mm -hmm. That's my first bar. Yeah. How close are you to the regulator saying, this is OK, not as a tertiary endpoint, but as primary or secondary. Mm -hmm. That's what gets my attention. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would love to work with these groups on. Let's move it toward being validated so they accept it, so that it can be a primary, preferably, but secondary is fine, to endpoint, and therefore it can be, it, it can be used more broadly. I think there's yeah. a panel on that topic later today, so we'll move <laughs> towards that. I, yeah. I, would just, I would just add to that. I think that bringing other pharma and companies together pre-competitively I think that's really where the win is because these young companies that are so you know, exciting with their new technology, they just need a little bit of guidance about what exactly. is accepted. What, mm -hmm. what do regulators you know, think about when they see their mm -hmm. technology? And we can help with, with guiding some of that. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a, lot, there's a huge you know, you know, focus on pre-competitive. And is that something you all do regularly in terms of advice? That's what I'm trying to get we're, 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're, we're working on it. Now on this media. You hear that? We're working on it, guys. I love it. Sponsored by Real We can blame yeah. Yeah. her, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Yeah. 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 Um, we partner with many startups and, and how we decide who, who we're going to partner with, aside from the does it make financial sense, et cetera, is how do their solutions fit in with our technology? Um, and then what does that provide to our sponsors and CROs? So for example, you know, we have a strategic partnership with Circuit Clinical. And the reason that we did that was now that we, now with them, we have the industry's only turnkey DCT solution ranging from sites all the way to, you know, monitoring and, um, measuring uh, patient um, experiences in clinical trials. So we look at what they're offering um, with what we're offering and then how it can benefit uh, sponsors and sites and CROs. Wonderful. Well, we have about a minute and a half left. So I just want to conclude by saying how optimistic I am about the future of clinical innovation with these sorts of folks around the table driving that. And I know that we've got a lot of people who are tuning in as well who probably feel the same way. So. Very, very thankful for all of your time and your insights, and I hope to continue to work together and I'll see yeah. some companies to do that with. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all so much. Yeah.